It's my great pleasure to introduce Michael Rosbach today. And I must say that today is kind of a special day to give a talk, and it's a very competitive day for doing so, because most people actually have other plans tonight to have dinner with their dear ones, being Valentine Day. So we have to love Michael very much to be here with him to celebrate Valentine Day and to listen to his talk. So Michael Rosbach comes from Brandeis University next to Boston. And he's actually, as a training, is a more of a molecular person. That means somebody who likes to play around with molecules. And actually what he has done over the last 20 years of his life is a bit unlikely for somebody who comes from molecular biology because he did basically dissect the whole pathway and understand basically a, a behavior. And I think what he has done is basically understand in, is in, in, a, in the most exquisite detail one, uh, uh, the only uh, behavior pathway for which we have any kind of sort of understanding. So um, Michael Rosbach was actually uh, trained as a molecular biologist, and he started his career by doing some work on RNA processing. For those who don't know, you know, RNA gets made, and then something happens, and they get shortened, and spliced, and whatsoever. But then about 25 years ago, he discovered something that actually somebody had published a very interesting paper, uh, which actually described a mutation in a fruit flies. And this mutation was actually a mutation that caused the fruit flies to behave in a very strange way. So instead of basically having rhythm of activity of 24 hours, some will actually behave with a much faster period, some will behave with a much longer period. And he called this gene period. This is actually the, 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 the summum actually of the productivity of a very famous man called Seymour Benzer. And the person who discovered this was actually Ron Konopka. And this must have been like in the early 1980s, maybe late 70s, where he discovered this purge. It's a mutation in somewhere in the genome of the flies that gets this striking phenotype where the fly behave in a very strange manner. So Michael must have realized at this point this was a really very in important discoveries and he decided to go after this gene and try to figure out what this gene was about. And it's how we are now 25 years later where we know basically everything about how those, this gene per and many other genes are involved in this kind of a loop of regulation which basically sets up the time at which you will wake up and the time, uh, at the time the flies wake up. Indeed, all of those genes that uh, Michael and his colleagues have identified seem to be also exist in us in, uh, in human and actually in every living organism, in every uh, animal, and they also expand, extend to, to plants. Plants actually, they were first discovered that uh, plants uh, move uh, uh, their leaves during the night, even in the light or they are in a complete darkness, and also even in bacteria, in cyanobacteria. So basically we're talking here about something which is absolutely fundamental to life, to be able to adjust to the fact that the day comes up uh, uh, in the morning and night comes up at night. So Mike has basically dissected this molecular pathway in exquisite detail, and over the last few years, he has embarked to actually understand what happened in terms of how now these molecules which get together into a cell actually now are acting onto the cell, and how this cell are going to basically tell the rest of the body what to do, how to behave, to sleep at night, and to be uh, uh, awake during the day. And since uh, quite a number of people who travel here in Abu Dhabi from very long distance, you are all aware of what jet lag means. And basically, jet lag is what you have to do against. You have to go against what Michael Rosbach is working on. So um, Mike has received quite a number of awards for what he's done over the last many years. And uh, he's a HHMI professor at Brandeis. And um, he's also recently received with two of his collaborators, Mike Young and, and Jeff Hall, Mike Young, his collaborator, is his, 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 his competitor, and Jeff Hall, his, his collaborator. There will be two very major awards, which basically are, uh, I would say, the first steps toward getting the Nobel Prize. And I strongly hope that uh, this beautiful work gets uh, soon awarded a Nobel Prize or something like that. So it got the Howard, Howard Horowitz Prize from Columbia and the Gruber Prize over the last two or three years with his two, two colleagues. And again, this just reflects how much, how important this pathway has been in trying to see how genes can control behavior. Behavior. So I'm going to invite Michael to come and to give us his talk. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. And Let me start by thanking Michael and Claude for the invitation. Claude, uh, merci infiniment. Uh, to uh, President Bloom, to uh, Provost Piano, grazie mille. And uh, to all of you for coming and listening to this, I have one, thanks, for coming and listening to this lecture. So <clears throat> I'm going to tell you, give you, this is a lay talk, 
So I hope I won't bore my scientist colleagues, but I'll try to put things in perspective and, and tell you about how I think the public um, should uh, think about this problem or why it's interesting. So as Claude said, this began a long time ago, this problem. And uh, uh, this is from Genesis, for those of you who don't recognize the prose. And uh, there was, uh, you'll also notice there's one one and one two are missing, but that's, they're not very important. There was darkness upon the earth and stuff like that. And <clears throat> it was recognized, of course, that uh, in one four, that the world was divided between uh, light and dark, and that's really uh, where things began. And this is not just metaphorical, of course, but the rotation of the Earth on its axis, this inexorable light-dark cycle, and change from high temperature to low temperature, from light to dark, is the uh, oldest, what the Germans call Zeitgeber, or temporal cue, uh, that life has been exposed to. So well before the atmosphere contained its current gaseous constitution, before nutrients were available in anything like the way we think about them, the world was rotating on its axis, and life, <coughs> principally cyanobacteria probably, at that early stage, uh, was exposed to this. And moving forward, of course, we now have the, uh, uh, virtually every organism manifests a circadian rhythm, and uh, what's depicted, of course, is nocturnal animals and diurnal animals. They have then exploited every available niche to try to uh, improve uh, fitness. And so uh, there are three ways of thinking about the problem, of course. Uh, one is that the, the rhythms um, drive uh, adaptation to these external daily oscillations, so to maximize the ability to avoid predators, find food, and find mates. Um, anticipation is the name of the game. That's what clocks really do. So if you're in the lab at 6 o'clock and uh, dinner is served at 6 o'clock and you look at your watch and say, oop, dinner time, that's not nearly as advantageous as looking at your watch at 5.30 and say, I have a half an hour to get home. Uh, I better leave now. So anticipating what's going to come food or punishment in that particular instance. <clears throat> and of course, uh, what's also relevant is that all the internal processes that take place within one individual, within one organism, have uh, an internal coherence. A has to happen, then B, then C. So oxidative and reduction, reductive reactions are often separated in time, if not in space. We do it in time. Certain cyanobacterial species do it in space. And, and uh, that's, that is also uh, another purpose. So as Claude indicated, and, and ironically, of course, this is a French gentleman who was generally credited with being the first to realize that rhythms were endogenous. So he uh, was quite taken by the fact that his plants um, manifested daily leaf, leaf movements. And he assumed, as did everyone else, that these were driven by the light-dark cycle. But being uh, an experimentalist, he took the plant down to his wine cellar, where temperature and light were constant. And he noticed that the plant continued to do its leaf movement, essentially, for an infinite period of time, with no changes in light and environmental cycle. And he concluded that the clock was endogenous and was just in communication with the light-dark cycle. And so that uh, leads us to the definitions of circadian rhythms. The, this clock is self-sustaining and that runs uh, in the absence of any external cues. But every day, uh, the light-dark cycle resets the clock. So in fact, our clock runs about 15 minutes slow. Humans have an endogenous rhythm of about 24 hours and 15 minutes. And light every day uh, resets the clock. It, it goes almost without saying that uh, fluorescent lighting has uh, had an impact on, on this natural environmental cycle, but that's uh, basically how things work. And, and a problem which is of intense interest to me, but one which I'm not going to speak about because it's both esoteric uh, <coughs> and virtually unknown, is the phenomenon of temperature compensation, or what a modern uh, biochemist would call temperature independence, uh, the fact that the periods of circadian rhythms 
are essentially invariant with uh, change in temperature. So <clears throat> a fruit fly at 18 degrees and 29 degrees shows no difference in its endogenous period. The Q10, in other words, is almost exactly 1.0, completely unlike the cell cycle and other periodic phenomena that biologists are interested in. And how that works is not known. So uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll j begin now by just pointing out a very common assay, a variant of which we use in, for fruit flies. So here's a, a hamster, which is on a running wheel. And, and the hamster's activity uh, can be recorded. And one gets uh, each of these uh, lines is a day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, and <clears throat> what one sees in constant darkness is the fact that the activity rest cycles are uh, offset Every day, it starts a little earlier than the day before. And that's because the free running period of that rodent is a little shorter than 24 hours. But if the animal is in a, is in a light dark cycle, then that light in the, in the manner that I described keeps the animal strictly on 24 hours. You'll also notice here that these, these uh, rodents are nocturnal. So each little tick is an activity event. And they sleep during the day and are active during the night. So uh, let, me, let me now say a word about uh, humans and disease. Uh, I, 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 it pains me to show this slide after last, uh, last week's Super Bowl, but I do it nonetheless. And, and, and mention the medical importance of circadian rhythms. A and I'll just uh, speak briefly about two of these, the first two, uh, and, then, and then in a bit about sleep disorders as well. So, uh, symptoms and occurrence of disease. So here's, here's a little cartoon of uh, how one might think about a human uh, day or a cycle. And you'll notice that uh, at different times of the day, different features of our, um, of our lifestyle are, are uh, peak uh, manifest as peaks and troughs. And all of this is under control of the circadian clock. And this leads to the fact that uh, disease frequency, for example, uh, also occurs uh, at different times of day. So this one, for instance, is quite well known that the incidence of stroke and heart attacks uh, occurs early in the morning uh, much more frequently than at other times of the day, coincident with rise in blood pressure and probably some effects on clotting um, as well. So all this kind of stuff is under clock control. And I'll also say a word about jet lag, which was number two on that list, um, something dear to mm, many of us at the moment. And, um, and, and I want to do it uh, with this anecdote. And it's not just an anecdote, but you'll be amazed to see that the reference for this letter to the editor, or brief communication, uh, is a paper in Nature that was authored by a colleague, circadian colleague and friend of mine, Bill Schwartz. And what he did was use the treasure trove of statistics that exist in, in uh, baseball lore. And, and uh, he wanted to test the notion, uh, which had been shown over and over again with experimental animals, that going from west to east takes longer to adapt uh, than going from east to west. And that's certainly my experience. So th there's a f there are always outliers, but if you ask people to raise their hands, who has more trouble going to Europe from the States than the other direction? Most people raise their hands and say, yeah, it takes me longer to adapt in that direction. So what he did was take west coast teams and east coast teams, um, which travel. And in baseball, unlike track and field, uh, there's no adaptation for jet lag. They, they fly, they play. And so, of course, uh, the home team wins more frequently than the visiting team, you know, for whatever reason, sleeping in your own bed. But then you can ask the question, uh, how does uh, traveling in a westward direction compare with traveling in an eastward direction? And all this was normalized for the same team and over a long period of time and so forth and so on. And so, uh, the, these <coughs> so this, this direction does considerably better than this direction, in other words, west to east in athletic performance suffers more than east to west, consistent with how long it takes a rodent 
to adjust uh, when you do a in lab jet lag experiment. So uh, that's human. So for the lay audience, and I hope I'm looking at a lot of scientists here, uh, <coughs> so I hope I, I won't uh, uh, bore that segment of the population too much. Um, let, let, let me uh, address the question of why genetics? Why, why do we do genetics to learn stuff? And, and uh, I, I want to distinguish this from the nature-nurture argument. So th this is not to argue that certain behaviors are innate or learned or anything like that. It is uh, to really figure out how processes that we have no idea um, what the machine is that governs the process or the phenomenon, what we would call the phenotype in genetics, how it works. And, and the, the mutant or genetics is an entree into this process. It's a wedge or a, or a path uh, down into the machine. And um, uh, this nature-nurture business is just perhaps worth noting that even learning relies on proteins. So, and of course, the genetics path is into the proteins. So, uh, this, this is really the, the purpose of such a thing. And then, of course, all this uh, relies on the, <coughs> the last half of the 20th century when molecular biology uh, came of age, uh, initiated by the Watson and Crick discovery of the uh, structure of the double helix. And th that has led or, or given rise to the fact that uh, the DNA and the DNA sequence uh, can reveal <coughs> the, the nature of the protein which must be involved in whatever process um, one is interested in because these are the powerhouses, the cellular machines which do the work. And so the strategy that came, of, uh, came uh, available in the 80s was to use genetics and recombinant DNA to identify a gene, identify a mutant, localize the, um, the gene on a chromosome, uh, clone the gene, and then identify the protein uh, from the DNA sequence. And <coughs> an illustration of this, and in, in general, a handful of, <coughs> uh, now more than a handful of human disease genes are, are very good illustrations of this general principle shown here is the uh, gene CFTR responsible for cystic fibrosis. Uh, this when this channel is mutant, then that's the cause of this devastating uh, human disease, and that was found by the route that I described before. And so this works great for single disease genes which have strong penetrance um, in the population. Of course, we're interested in behavior, hum and and uh, this is a much more daunting challenge. Uh, shown here is a picture of uh, uh, a pair of identical twins who were reared apart. They were separated as infants and raised on two coasts and then found each other in their 40s or 50s and they had both become firemen. They had both married blonde women. They both played pinochle. I don't remember the whole story. But the, 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 the strong suspicion, of course, was they not only looked alike, grew mustaches, but that they had a lot of behavior traits in common, which uh, one would attribute uh, to the fact that they're identical twins and have the same genes. The problem is, of course, to figure out what those genes are, uh, because there are so many of them that contribute to the phenotype, is, is, a, is an overwhelming task. And so, based on the... Uh, human disease gene uh, analogy, if you like, uh, single gene mutations are the way to go, meaning that's what you have to do in order to, in order to carve that path into the process. And so um, our friend Drosophila melanogaster enters into the story at this point, and it's almost exactly 100 years ago that Thomas Hunt Morgan and his incredible uh, trio of Columbia undergraduates, two of which are shown here, uh, started to work on this organism and to establish uh, the field of fly genetics. A, a story told about this is that mm, <clears throat> Drosophila is, is a species which really um, 
is, is uh, friendly to humans. And in September, when everyone came back to work in the fall semester, and in those days, people took the summer, the whole summer off, so they would show up in September, and, and the, the, the bagged lunch with fruit would be on the, on the open windowsill. And so, you know, the fruit flies would come in, and apparently that, that inspired uh, uh, a more detailed examination of this particular species. So, uh, Drosophila mutants. So this is a, a white-eyed fly, which is the first mutant that was uh, found, a spontaneous mutant in that, in that group. And that strategy, not spontaneous mutants, but feeding the flies mutagens, and then, and then looking for phenotype, is what uh, Kanopka and Benzer did, and this is exactly 40 years ago. Claude got all the key points right, but just the numbers are off. He's really the molecular biologist, you know, 30 years, 40 years. So, so it's <coughs> 40, 40 years ago, this paper was published uh, by uh, Kanopka, was Benzer's student, and, and I uh, had no clue about this paper for more than a decade. In other words, I, I had never heard of it. I didn't even know what rhythms were uh, for, for quite some period of time, but this was a, a landmark paper, and the reason it was so influential was because they, they isolated three different mutants with no rhythms, fast rhythms, and slow rhythms, and they were all alleles of the same gene. In other words, they all mapped to the same gene. They were all allelic, and this is, <coughs> this is um, analogous to doing um, a, a, a gain of function and a loss of function experiment and getting opposite. So this is, you, you say, wow, this, this, mm, the chance of this being an accident or um, six phosphoglucose mutase uh, seems small. And, and so that's really what inspired uh, me and, and uh, my colleagues uh, to look at this. So let me tell you how um, Ron and we still to this day assay locomotor activity of the fly. So this is the fly's sleep-wake cycle. And, and we have lots and lots of these tubes, um, and that's one fruit fly, that's some food, and that's a stopper up in that end of the tube. And uh, this is the original device that Kanopka helped us at Brandeis build. There's the cap on the tube, a little fly food in the bottom. There's a fly which can move uh, back and forth and across each of these tubes is an infrared light beam and a uh, phototube which will detect the light. So every time the fly breaks the light beam, uh, there's an event recorded, and of course when the fly is resting or sleeping, nothing happens, and so like for the hamster, you get periods of activity, and then you get periods of inactivity or rest. And, <coughs> and so uh, th this is uh, the records from the uh, original Kanopka experiment. So these are activity records, and there's morning activity and evening activity. This is an incubator, this is the night, this is day, night, day. And so there's activity, and then the lights are shut off, and, and the wild-type fly continues to manifest a circa 24-hour rhythm. Circadian is circa dia, about a day. And, and the, the fly in constant darkness, the wild-type fly, continues um, to, to mm, be right on track, whereas the per-short fly, which has a 19 or 20-hour rhythm, one of the alleles he isolated, you'll notice that every day it ends its activity and begins its activity four or five hours earlier than the day before. So this is a, this is a striking phenotype, um, and, and the other two alleles were uh, equally compelling. And today, we have uh, mm, several thousand uh, boards like this where we can record the, <coughs> the behavior of the locomotor activity of a, large number, of a large number of flies. So like CFTR in the 80s, we set out, uh, that is Jeff Hall and I at Brandeis and, and independently Mike Young at Rockefeller, who has not been a competitor for a long time. He's also a colleague. Uh, <clears throat> so that was when we were young and stupid. Um, so uh, we, we set out to clone and, and sequence this gene, and we did that, both groups, and we did the first gene rescue. We could show we had the right piece of DNA, 
But it turned out that it was a pioneer protein. These are the early days of DNA sequencing. And the, reason, the way you figure out what you have is by matching it to known proteins in the database. Well, we didn't have any matches because there were only 12 proteins or 100 or some very small number in the database at the time. So for a, five years or so, we, were, uh, we wandered uh, aimlessly in the desert, uh, to use Brandeis uh, or Abu Dhabi uh, metaphor. And, <clears throat> and uh, two decades after Konopka and Benzer's paper, that is in 1990, Paul Harden, who was a postdoc in my lab, made uh, a very important finding. And, and that finding was that the uh, RNA, the messenger RNA from the period gene, underwent circadian oscillations in level. And they were very profound. So here, here's the, um, a, a scan of a RNA's protection experiment. This was way before PCR, so done by old-fashioned technology. And every day, the messenger RNA went up and down and up and down. And <clears throat> here is the per short mutant with 19 hour, um, with a 19 or 20 hour period. And what I think you can notice is that by four cycles, the wild type um, fly is about a half a cycle longer, about 12 hours longer than the four cycles here from the per short fly. In other words, the RNA oscillation is running fast, just like the behavior. And, and uh, when we put this together with a couple of other pieces of information, most importantly, the fact that we had a little tiny bit of homology with uh, a transcription factor by this period, this time, now six years after we cloned the gene, and, and the fact that we, had, we, we uh, discovered that it was a nuclear protein, we argued that this worked directly uh, <clears throat> and that the period protein inhibited its own transcription and we had also shown that that RNA oscillation was transcriptional, and that this was the core timekeeping mechanism, a transcriptional feedback loop that, um, that was sat at the heart or near the heart of, of circadian timekeeping. So the positive transcription factors, that X in the previous, in the previous picture, um, damn. that X here in the previous picture was uh, cloned um, in, in mutant screens in, in my lab uh, in, in 1998. And uh, it was independently identified in mice by Joe Takahashi actually a few months before we found those mutants. And so that, that led um, to a picture which is true today that <coughs> clock and cycle or its orthologous proteins, clock and BMAL1 in mammals, leads to the transcription of its negative regulators per and timeless in flies, or per and cryptochrome in mammals. Three of these four proteins are orthologs. One of them is a swap, for reasons which are not entirely clear. And, and this is the center of the timekeeping loop. There's more bells and whistles, but I think this is um, a, a, a sufficiently accurate simplification to, to, uh, to uh, make, make this particular point. And this general picture <coughs> is, is also true for neurospora, plants, uh, all systems which have been um, investigated in detail. Namely, there is an activator which leads to the synthesis of repressor message, and tra that's translated. The messenger RNA builds up. Um, that protein goes into the nucleus and represses its own transcription. The messenger RNA decays, the protein decays. That takes 24 hours, and the whole process starts over again. And so the, 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 um, not to leave you with the impression that all of the regulation is transcriptional, that it all has to do with the synthesis of uh, RNA, uh, these proteins also are highly modified. Um, this is the molecular weight. This is the period protein as it's synthesized, and then it experiences a tremendous number of phosphorylation events. Some of those kinases are known. I'll mention them in a moment. And, and then the protein in the morning and the timeless protein in the morning is proteolized, and, and that this is going to, this is, this is even not jet lagged. I can't handle this. 
you know, this is going to set off my TV at home or something. So, uh, so there's, there's, there's both uh, post-translational modification and also proteolysis of these proteins, and that's, that's part of the process. So I, I think uh, one should think about this process uh, as a series of steps, that is transcription, uh, translation of the proteins. Those proteins are phosphorylated. Uh, <clears throat> there's um, entrance of the repressors into the nucleus. Uh, repression of transcription, actually the formation of uh, on DNA repression complexes, and then those proteins, the repressors are phosphorylated and degraded, and um, the process, the uh, cycle starts over again. And, and timing, um, I would argue, is, is, is the, the sum of the timing of each of those uh, individual steps. And so today there are 12 to 15 Drosophila clock genes, which have been identified, and we can put them in two categories. There are transcription factors, some of which I've already mentioned to you, clock cycle period and timeless, and there are kinases or phosphatases or modifying enzymes, which work in concert with the transcription factors. In fact, they, they modify the transcription factors and, um, and affect the timing. The asterisks here indicate that the same proteins uh, do the same job in mammals, and, and the number of asterisks indicate that uh, we, we're dealing with a highly uh, conserved process that's uh, undoubtedly existed in the, uh, in the ancestor of flies and mammals 550 million years ago. So I want to particularly point out three of these proteins, two transcription factors, the period repressor and a protein called uh, clockwork orange, which is named DEC1 in mammals, two transcription factors, and the kinase double time, or CK1. Why am I pointing out those three in particular? Because those three have been linked to uh, a human syndrome, um, advanced sleep phase syndrome. So what is advanced sleep phase syndrome? That is uh, people who mm, fall asleep at seven at night or so, sleep a perfectly restful eight hours, and wake up at three in the morning. They cannot stay awake in the evening. And <clears throat> although many individuals who have that phenotype and um, that kind of thing increases with age, of course, but not, not so extreme. Um, but some, some uh, physicians in Utah got interested in this problem. Louis Patchik in particular, who was then uh, on the faculty of the University of Utah. Why Utah? Because the Mormons uh, are, are genealogical uh, fanatics, and they keep tremendous records of their large families. And so it was possible to find out whether Sibs, parents, grandparents, great uncles, great aunts had the same uh, syndrome. And <clears throat> indeed, there were three families in which this phenomenon was inherited in a Mendelian and a simple Mendelian fashion. And those three families, the gene was localized one of them to the period gene, the PER2 gene of humans, um, <clears throat> one of them to CK1, a mutant which modifies the period protein, and the third in this um, other transcription factor, DEC1 or CWO, um, which is in fact gives rise to a slightly different sleep syndrome phenotype. So closing the circle, uh, clock genes originally found in fly screens um, as the culprit or the cause of human um, sleep syndromes. So, whoops. So I, I'll just mention the fact that uh, we can take individuals, <coughs> let's say people from these sleep families, and one can culture their fibroblasts and actually examine endogenous circadian gene expression um, from those particular individuals. So if you were interested in finding out whether uh, Claude's endogenous oscillator has a different characteristic from mine, um, you could culture our fibroblasts, um, infect the fibroblast with a virus which has a reporter gene on it, and then actually measure the period, the distance between those peaks and get a, a picture of diff inter-individual differences. So that particular picture leads me 
to, uh, to mention the fact that in mice, humans, and fruit flies, um, the, this, this clockwork, what I've described as this transcriptional translational feedback loop, operates in, in most tissues in the animal, liver, skeletal muscle, lung. One can explant these tissues in culture and using reporter methods show that they undergo oscillation. And of course, there's also clocks in the brain <coughs> of which the suprachiasmatic nucleus is the most important place in the hypothalamus, which I'll um, have a word or two to say about in a moment. So, um, so this um, little feedback loop here, which I've described to you, of course, doesn't just drive the expression of these few repressor molecules, but it, dr it drives the expression of a number of other proteins, many of which are transcription factors themselves, and which then give rise to uh, secondary or tertiary targets, uh, which give rise to the thousands of RNAs, which undergo circadian oscillation in, in all of the tissues of our body. So it's estimated that at least 15 percent of the mRNAs in the liver undergo robust circadian oscillations. Uh, and so uh, these output functions, there's a myriad of output functions, as indicated by that, that first uh, physiology slide I told you. So now I, I want to just mention two brief stories um, a, as a way of putting a little bit of this in perspective. So clock and cycle are the transcription factors which sit at the top of this hierarchy. And, and I want to describe very briefly um, an experiment done a few years ago that indicates a uh, clock is a master control gene. And this, <clears throat> this experiment links to people here and phenomena that, uh, that many of you are well acquainted with. So it, it was shown uh, in the 90s that master control genes, of which I guess PAC6 is the best example, uh, can, uh, if ex misexpressed in ectopic locations, can, can give rise to uh, the organ which they control um, in strange places. So if you um, express PAC6 in the leg or in the wing, you, you end up having eye tissue in the wrong place, indicating that that single transcription factor um, can give rise to the entire developmental program. And so in the temporal domain, as opposed to the spatial domain, um, we can do and have done the same thing with the clock transcription factor, which also sits at the top of our temporal hierarchy. So this is the Drosophila brain, um, at least a circadian view of the Drosophila brain. There are about 75 pairs of neurons, shown one, one side here, which are where the clock is ticking away in the fly brain. So these are the only places that we know of in which the clock proteins are inexorably being made and oscillate the RNAs as well as uh, the proteins. And uh, if we uh, ectopically express elsewhere in the brain uh, the clock transcription factor, so this is just a scheme that's designed to express that protein elsewhere in the brain, elsewhere from those 75 pairs of neurons, then we find uh, cycling, that is, we can now see in hundreds, if not thousands, of additional cells, uh, we find oscillators which are created by merely expressing that one master protein in the brain. So instead of just having 75 cells, there are 750 or several thousand cells. So this, this argues that clock, indeed, clock and cycle sit at the top of the hierarchy, and they can induce the entire program by just expressing um, that one protein. So uh, let me return to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Um, this is an area of the mammalian hypothalamus, which contains the master circadian oscillator and has about 10,000 pairs of neurons in, in, uh, on both sides of the brain. Uh, here's the hypothalamus in cartoon form. And the reason we, of course, like the fly brain is because it has only 75 neurons, and they're very well separated into a few groups. 
So from an experimental point of view, it's much easier uh, to manipulate this than it is to manipulate this spaghetti here in the, in the mammalian brain. And, and the importance of the SCN uh, <clears throat> in, this, in this context, and the reason I raise it, is to point out to you that, uh, the that, the, that mammals get light information. In other words, how do we get to be 24 hours rather than 24 hours and 15 minutes? Only through one place, this way, through the eyes, and then the retina hypothalamic tract, which goes back to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So the skull prevents the ability to get light information in any other way except through the eyes. And then if the SCN regulates the HPA axis, so all the hormones like cortisol, which go up and down during the day and, uh, and even in inappropriate times when you have to give a lecture like this, uh, uh, the HPA axis is under SCN control, and then the HPA axis connects with all the peripheral organs so that the stuff that's going up and down in serum is keeping all the peripheral clocks in sync. Um, and so <coughs> this, this slide, unfortunately, is, is, is just, I couldn't find a better one uh, under the time constraints. It, it is designed to point out that two key models in the, in the circadian world, zebrafish and drosophila, unlike mammals, they get light information directly into the brain. So the cuticle of the fruit fly is so transparent, so thin, that light can penetrate directly into those 75 pairs of neurons, and those cells contain their own photoreceptor. So the fly neurons are, are cell autonomous in their ability to interact with the light-dark cycle, with the light world, and don't require any kind of specialized access. And <clears throat> this issue of light perception uh, and the photoreceptor um, brings me really to the last point that I wanted to talk about, which is a little bit about evolution and, and something that Claude touched on, and that is to ask the question, uh, well, we know that, uh, that mammals and fruit flies have a very similar molecular clock, and as I said, indicating that that preexisted the split between uh, insects and mammals. But what about the other systems in the world that are used? Uh, for example, Neurospora, especially plants, which have a very robust, um, plants, which have a very robust uh, circadian system and, and also cyanobacteria. So let me just say that the cyanobacteria clock, which is extremely elegant and, and um, beautifully worked on initially by Kondo in Japan, um, has no homology, no relationship to the animal proteins, zero. And, and I think the implication of that is that uh, the circadian rhythms have evolved at least twice in evolution, once in cyanobacteria, and a second time in, in some precursor of animals. At least there's no way to molecularly link the cyanobacterial clock um, to animal clocks. And so the link, perhaps, between plants and animals, and an interesting story in its own right, is based on these photoreceptors which live in the brain of fruit flies and zebrafish. And these, uh, and plants, and these, uh, <clears throat> these photoreceptors are called cryptochrome, and, and they're blue light photoreceptors, and they act also uh, to, mm, to drive phototropism in plants as well as contribute to the circadian clock. And, and what's fascinating about this category of molecules is that they are kissing cousins of uh, a protein that we heard about today. Um, called photolyases, and these are <coughs> DNA repair enzymes in E. coli and metazoans, these uh, excise thymine dimers um, from DNA and, and replace them um, with, with, proper, with a proper pair of, of thymidines under, under, uh, in, in a blue light dependent way. And cryptochromes are blue light photosensors. And these have been crystallized. We know a lot about the relationship between these two. They're really 
uh, first cousin family members in which there's a flavin in the active site and then often a second chromophore to expand the dynamic, the range of, uh, uh, of light that can be uh, absorbed. So these proteins sit in the neurons of the fruit fly and in zebrafish, these, these proteins, these, these light receptors. And <clears throat> I think a way to think about evolution and the origin of the circadian system is, is analogous to uh, this friend here that I uh, mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, PAC6 or the eyeless gene. And, and I, I, I added this slide in part as, as a, a thank you to Claude because I think he was the first one to point out in the literature, what, 15 years ago or something, that <coughs> this, this gene, which is responsible for this elaborate tissue um, in both mammals and fruit flies, that is the development of the eye, and of course it's, they're so different, these two tissues, how is it possible that the same gene can do these two different things? And, and what, was, what was realized um, was that this gene also drives the terminal differentiated product, which is present or in both flies and mammals. Namely, it's, it's a major transcription factor for the rhodopsin gene. So it's, it's easy to imagine that the transcription of rhodopsin was uh, the first thing that this transcription factor did, and then it elaborated these more complex functions in a tissue specific, in, a, in an organism specific way much later. And so uh, <clears throat> by analogy, it's, it's I think amusing to imagine that this photoreceptor, cryptochrome, or perhaps a relative which also has light sensitivity and has a relationship to DNA because it is a DNA repair protein, that, that it, it um, it responded to light and, uh, and, and then also learned to regulate itself because of its ability to bind to DNA. So the relationship to DNA and the relationship to light give it the capacity to, uh, to let's say, begin a transcriptional feedback, transcriptional feedback regulation. And, and that um, really mm, cements uh, or underscores, uh, I think, a key idea in the field that the driving force for circadian rhythms way back when was flight from light. In other words, light um, is really damaging to DNA and uh, some organism uh, in its signal transduction pathway decided to run behind a rock and, and avoid full illumination and uh, cryptochromes were a very likely candidate for the sensor which measured how much illumination. And the reason I mention uh, ocean here is that at, at my, only, uh, uh, my only collaborative paper with Walter Gehring, theoretical paper was, was to argue that animals in the ocean, which many of which are known to sink and rise in diurnal fashion, um, <clears throat> it's not known to be circadian but suspected they sink and rise in, 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 in fashion. And the only way they could measure how much illumination there is, in other words, to sink when the sun is high and avoid damage, and then rise in the evening as the illumination goes down, is through a blue light photoreceptor, because that's the only a light which can penetrate any distance uh, into the ocean. So that, that would explain why uh, blue light. And of course, signal transduction would be the beginning because you'd say, oops, uh, this ain't good. I better get out of here. And of course, eventually, somebody learned to anticipate the light, which was always occurring at the same time of day. And so one can view cryptochromes and perhaps signal transduction proteins like um, casein kinase 2, which a, a, a rhythm kinase, which is shared between plants and animals as, as, as primordial um, in this uh, in, this, uh, in the origin of circadian rhythms. So <clears throat> I haven't talked at all about uh, what my lab is uh, currently up to. I'll do that uh, in 20 minutes on Thursday, but these are uh, my current lab members uh, who keep me uh, afloat. And, and uh, I, I thought if in a public lecture forum 
for those of you who are not practicing or incipient budding scientists, I, I, I wanted to say something about um, having a uh, successful career and the importance of good luck. You know, so, so not non-scientists think of us as, I think, I think the name of this lecture is Luminary, if I'm not mistaken, which is, which is uh, a daunting, a daunting uh, noun. And so let, let me just say about my, uh, my um, affair with circadian rhythms, uh, I knew nothing about genetics when I took my job as an assistant professor. I was a nucleic acid chemist, and, and, and so I learned genetics from my colleagues at Brandeis. Much of what, uh, what we do as faculty, we don't do with our own hands. And many of the discoveries are made by our great students and postdocs, and the key is to stay out of their way and not screw up what they do. Uh, <coughs> recombinant DNA, um, came along at just the right time for this field because those mutants, as fascinating as they were, were completely opaque to, to really uh, experimental advance. And, and I like to uh, think that recombinant DNA was our um, Ingrid Bergman. And, and to quote Rick Blaine, of all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world, uh, she walked into mine. The only difference is, of course, that we got to get on the plane to Lisbon, uh, and, you know, and he didn't. Although there was a second ending of the movie, and they didn't ever film that one. Uh, and so uh, <coughs> the, last, the last two points were a complete accident, of course. The feedback loop that we discovered turned out to be correct. It turned out to be general, applied to mammals. Who knew? We were working on flies. And, and, and then um, we had no clue how much of, uh, how much of physiology uh, was under circadian control, the fact that virtually everything that we touch, that we eat, sleep, wake, libido, you name it, uh, is under circadian control. And of course, um, the country uh, I've worked in is generously supports uh, good science. And so I'm going to end uh, with a poem which is written by uh, Ralph Greenspan's wife. And for those of you who know the, uh, the little book, Fly Pushing, uh, this is actually on the, on the front piece. And, and um, it, it refers to the fact that those of us who do this for a living, our wives have to put up with uh, a mistress. Uh, but but uh, I, I like to argue that this mistress has advantages for my wife over the alternative. And so with, <coughs> with that, uh, thank you very much. People push the idea that in addition to circadian rhythms, there's a homeostatic genetic program that regulates tiredness in general as distinct. What's your view on that? Well, I think I think the evidence I, I think the evidence for that is very good. So um, m most the, the 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 notion is based on. Um, the notion is based on both human and animal experiments, and it specifically uh, applies to sleep and sleep-wake. And so our circadian system is regulating alertness, and, and, um, and, and there's a dip at four in the afternoon, you know, when, when seminars are going on and everybody's closing their eyes, and, and the circadian system is, is keeping us alert um, at, at nine and 10 at night, um, when, when uh, the tiredness or the homeostatic system, is, is, which is measuring how long we've been awake, is saying it's time to go to sleep. So it's, it's really dual regulation, and the, and the homeostatic system is, is, is a measurement of how long we've been awake or how much sleep we've had the night before. And, 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 and really the evidence for that, the best evidence for that, is the uh, sleep deprivation experiments in which you make up um, sleep, both the quantity of sleep and the depth of slow wave sleep, the amplitude of slow wave sleep, based on, on um, sleep need. And that's independent of circadian. So there's really a dual regulatory system. The clock is continuously ticking away, and alertness and tiredness and alertness and tireless. And then there's a measurement system, which is completely unknown, uh, as far as I know, for, for keeping track of sleep need. 
And, and the, the, I think the evidence is very good for that, although nothing understood as far as I uh, Have you found a mutant that doesn't have any clock at all amongst flies? And if so, um, is there a side effect if you don't have any clock? If you're a dark and you don't care anymore? So, so, um, so one of the original mutants, there, there's, there are many arrhythmic mutants that are available now. They've okay. all been, they've oh, all been in. pair zero? Yeah, per zero, okay. for instance. And, and, and there's clock and cycle mutants, which have no rhythms. And they're all, they're all um, induced by mutagenesis. So there's, there, there's not been, to my knowledge, a natural um, mutant or, or a spontaneous mutant or an organism, um, you know, the cave fish notwithstanding, that, that doesn't have one. And for some animals, it's been shown that this contributes to fitness. So you can do an experiment. It hasn't been done for flies, but it's been done for... Uh, for plants and, and for cyanobacteria, you can show that, um, that, that the rhythm actually contributes to fitness. But you'd have to, in the lab, in flies, it, there hasn't really been, I, I think, a convincing experiment done to show that the flies are in any way um, at, at, a, at a disadvantage. Uh, we even tried mating. We put them in competition with other males, you know, a minimal number of males, and looked at nothing. So, so I, I think it's a lab artifact that we don't have a natural fitness um, assay that's robust. Uh, and I'm sure if we released them, you know, out into the wild and tagged them and then came back, you know, that we'd have we'd, there'd be an issue. But I, that's speculation. The temperature compensation, the, yes. the, the relative amounts of two things with different Q10s might be a way to temperature compensate. So there must be mutations that have. Uh, a lack of temperature compensation? Could you tell us a little bit? Yeah, yeah. so, so there, there, there are mutations, and there are, there are several mm, papers published in high-profile journals, including one of mine, uh, that, that address this issue. Um, I, I think the problem with the, with the mutation business is that it, it, it creates a different rate-limiting step, and, and it can even create a temperature-sensitive rate limiting step. And so the, the mutation is, is, is dangerous um, to, to extrapolate from mutant back to the wild type circumstance when you know, the wild type uh, situation is rate limiting. So there's lots of uh, uh, cogent, so here, here's a model which hasn't been shown, right? So we know that kinases and phosphatases are important for keeping time. So all you need, and the kinases, of course, drive it one way and phosphatases drive it the other. So if the kinase and phosphatase pair working on a particular step have the same temperature coefficient, then, then, then you, you, know, you get temperature compensation. So th there's other, I, I could give you two or three different scenarios like that. It's just that it hasn't been shown to, to be the case. Good evening. Thank you very much for your, the presentation. I apologize in advance if this is a very obvious question, but I'm one of the lay people in the audience, and so it may not be quite the level that some of the questions have been. But if we go back to the, what you were saying about the advanced sleep phase syndrome, so in people who have that syndrome, for example, when they were studying the Utah family, is everything off their own? So for example, the blood pressure, circadian that you showed very early, or the asthma time a little after midnight, is that off by a few hours as well, or is that still like everybody else in the population? Th that's a wonderful question. I don't know the answer. I, I, I swear that it wasn't measured because I know those papers very well. I could have forgotten. The prediction, as you intimate, is that it would all be changed because, of course, the, you, you're, the, the whole, the whole f uh, phenomenon is interpreted as these individuals have a phase problem. So in other words, the, the eight hours of sleep in their life is completely normal except for the fact that the rest of the world is operating on a different schedule. So, so m my strong prediction would be that all those other things would be shifted as well. But I, I, I don't remember it being measured. So aging people have difficulties keeping their clock ticking, right? Sorry? Aging people have difficulties keeping their clock ticking properly. So is, it, is it the same in flies? Can you use the fly to model this? So, so I, I don't think aging um, the, 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 there have been several groups who have worked hard on human aging and the clock. 
And, and I think it's fair to say that they really fail to find anything substantive. <clears throat> and so everything gets a little bit worse, of course, as you age. But, but surprisingly, the endogenous oscillator, as measured by these indirect means, stays pretty robust. And a colleague of mine, Amita Segal at Penn, just published a paper on aging flies. And, and so the behavior um, gets sort of poopy um, as, as they get older. You know, it gets, it gets sloppy, and the sleep-wake cycle isn't so accurate. But if you go look at the, at the clock proteins in the clock neurons, it's indistinguishable from young flies. So the oscillator, both in humans and flies, seems to really work quite well. And all the other stuff which, <coughs> which gets uh, poor, poorer as you age, indeed gets poorer. So you know, sleep, sleep gets worse, for sure, for everybody with aging. But I don't think it's a clock problem. That's, that's the guess from the literature. I've lived here for eight years, so thinking about the local culture for nigh on 1,400 years since the advent of Islam, or, or potentially thousands of years in the desert, they wake up before dawn, which can be 4.30 a.m. in the morning in summer, uh, work for eight hours, have a long afternoon nap, wake up again at five, and then stay awake until midnight or later, have a couple of, have four or five hours sleep. And I've seen this happen for the last eight years, and it seems to be an adaptation to the desert environment. Does that mean for centuries this culture has been fighting their circadian rhythm? So, so, so it, you know, I can, only, I can only guess or speculate, but um, my, my guess is that their circadian rhythms are perfectly normal and uh, not any different than somebody in the summer or somebody would be in the West under, under comparable light dark circumstances. What, what's very adaptable is sleep, how you organize your sleep, and it's unrelated to rhythms. Napping, napping is terrific. Um, and if you, if you, you know, plenty of cultures take a big nap in the middle of the day, and they sleep less at night. And, and it doesn't affect the clock. The clock keeps on ticking, uh, but you can manipulate this homeostatic, this homeostatic sleep system um, by, by screwing around with, with how you sleep. So that would be my interpretation. I'd be surprised if the clock is altered by any of that. You know. um, I'm sorry if this has, doesn't have much to do with the talk, but how much of, this, uh, how much of, of what you've talked about has to do with the more immediate perception of time, as in the case of a percussionist keeping a beat, or in the case of my perception of how much time has passed? Uh, you know, this is, this is I, I was, it doesn't, you're, you're right, it has not, it has, but it's, a, but it's, it has nothing to do with it, but it's a fascinating question and it's, and it's, uh, it's, it's incredibly uh, poignant because I, I was at, in UCLA on last Tuesday and I was in the office of a neuroscientist who I'd never met, but I communicated by email over some politics, something, something completely unrelated. And, and, and he, he, and he is very interested, he posed exactly the same question you did, and used exactly the same analogy or the same the same example. You know, if you if you uh, if you go beep beep, or go beep beep, you know that the second one has a larger interval than the first one. And, and how do you know that? Right? That's that's your question. And is that related to sir? So I would be shocked if that's related to circadian rhythms. I've been shocked before, but. But, uh, and, and I, I presume that's a neural circuitry problem that's embedded somehow in, in you know, in, in circuits and no, but, but this is the center of his research program and nobody knows how you know that the first one had a shorter rule than the second one. So I think that's, you know, that's where we should. I've got a question in regards to artificial light. Um, obviously, the amount of light available now, well, we've experienced is increased due to artificial light as well as natural diurnal light. Would there be a long-term effect in the natural world um, because the circadian rhythm has been pushed so much further because of light and then reduced because of the darkness? Like, is there a studies into that at all? So, so I, I, I only know of one, um, so, so the suspicion is 
Um, the suspicion is the answer is yes, there, there will be consequences or there are consequences, but it's been hard to prove. And, and let, let me back up and, and try and put this in context. So, so one of the important things about summer and winter is, is its effect on physiology. So a lot of animals, for instance, their, their whole reproductive system is, is under seasonal control, sheep as a, as a uh, well-known example. And, and the clock is, is participating as an intermediary in, in translating the seasonal changes into reproductive changes. And, and so, so uh, the, the clock and the light-dark cycle have an important effect on physiology. And, and the suspicion is that humans, which live now under continuous summer, can do with 18 hours, 16 to 18 hours of illumination, and, and fluorescent lighting is, is, is plenty strong enough to reset the clock and all that kind of So we, we basically live in perpetual, perpetual summer. The suspicion is that that has um, impact on, on, um, on human physiology. And the, 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 a guy at the NIH, I'm, I'm, I really should tell this in the bar, I mean the equivalent here in Abu Dhabi in the bar. Um, the, the, uh, a, a guy at the NIH who, who worked, a human psychiatrist interested in this problem, got a bunch of volunteers, uh, male volunteers, and he had them li living for three months um, at the, sleeping at the NIH, three months under controlled conditions, um, and, and whereby he made them uh, sleep for 13 hours a night. And so no, the, the lights went off, no, no reading, no, no stimulation, no, no nothing. And, and the, the, it, it turned out to be, the subjective data were extremely interesting because everybody increased their sleep dramatically to 10 or 11 hours a night, um, which is, so everybody sleeped, but, but they reached, this, not, not just the first few days when you make up the lost sleep, but they, they hit a steady state and were sleeping for the whole length of the experiment, 10 or 11 hours, very happily. And, and presumably, as people did in the old days, when the lights went out, you just, and, uh, and, uh, and then uh, they had them EEG recorded. So they were really measuring sleep. And for the extra two or three hours, like, like our puppies, they were lying there in, in almost in meditation mode, awake, but extremely subjective reporting, extremely happy. This no no sense of anxiety, nothing whatsoever. And what he was, what he, but he couldn't, he didn't see a statistical change in testosterone levels. So that was the that was the idea. Would would there be uh, hormonal changes which he could uh, which he could detect by trying to really recapture natural seasonal lighting? So it wasn't anyway. That's a long answer to say I don't know. But it's a, <laughs> but <clears throat> but it's an amusing it's an amusing story. That was a. Yeah, I had a question regarding circuitry. So uh, there's a comparatively small number of neurons in the fly brain that are sort of primary clock neurons. Yep. And a, I guess a comparatively small part of the mouse brain that's a primary clock center. So where do neurons in those areas project? What is the circuitry? In, in the mouse or the fly? Both, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in the mouse, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forget about two-thirds of these. But the... The, the SCN projects to all sorts of places, the PBN and, and a whole bunch of other nuclei, where it's really governing um, largely through synaptic connections, a little bit through humoral connections, um, uh, the, the entire HPA axis. But I always forget the, the precise names of the, of the places it projects to. And in the fly, it's, 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 less, well, it's less well studied, but those fly neurons project they, they connect to each other, and um, uh, people have not yet rigorously connected that to the motor center. So in the flies, the idea, of course, is that the clock neurons are driving activity rest, and, and one would like to draw uh, a complete picture um, of that, and it's, it's, it's not quite there yet. Close, but not quite. The elusive small molecule that Dr. Desplan is looking for I assume that if you take a group of fibroblasts and dissociate them, each keeps a rhythm, but they then run out of sync with each other, whereas if it's put as a coherent mass, they synchronize together, suggesting something 
is being uh, transported between them to keep that rhythm constant. So, so um, let, let's see. Um, people have done small molecule screens using the fibroblast system as the assay, and so there are small molecules which will influence rhythms by that. Uh, and so, so you're, you're not completely correct about the dissociation, and it's, and it's, um, and it's under um, intense investigation at the moment. So uh, the, the individual fibroblasts really do quite well. And, and what hasn't been done for the fibroblasts, an experiment that was done about 25 years ago for pinealocytes, is to put individual cells, one cell in a dish, and, and measure its rhythm un, un, um, unconnected from neighbors and, and really to rigorously exclude communication between them. But, uh, but, but they do pretty well and the suspicion is that, that uh, I, I shouldn't say, that, that whether there is or is not communication between those cells. They do drift, they do drift out of sync um, after a, a, a synchronization pulse. So you can, you can cause them all to begin together, and, and then they, uh, they, they drift apart a little bit after, after two or three days. So 